Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bifir. Lord Saladin Forge was recently taken into the Cabal War Council under Empress Keitel's command, and was anointed as Bracchus Forge, a title befitting his rank as an Iron Lord most certainly, but also one that came with a fair degree of protest from within Keitel's own ranks. I'm sure that many of you now know that Saladin has been promoted from Bracchus to Vallas. Today we're going to tell the story of how that happened, who he unseated in order to earn that title, and the ramifications of that major shift in both power and trust within the Ascendancy. It should be said that Saladin's rise to Vallas is one that may have played into Eurix's hands. The elevation of a Guardian, at the expense of a Scion, will not have gone unnoticed. We first learn about Saladin's interactions with the Cabal back in the Season of the Lost. Saladin's experience with being deceived by Savathun opened his eyes to new possibilities and informed him that for the good of the city, old hatreds had to be put aside. There was a greater foe facing them in the form of the Witch Queen, and the forces of Sol needed to face her together. This was to say nothing of the forces of Shivor Wrath and the Black Fleet, who were also bearing down on the Dreaming City at this time. This would be the first point at which Lord Saladin would meet with Valas Uruk, his counterpart in the Cabal Ascendancy, and the commander that he would one day rise to replace. Each passing moment is marked by the click of an analog timer on the wall. When the pressure gauge reaches 100%, the timer releases a final click, and the airlock door grinds open in the hangar bay. Lord Saladin tucks his helmet under his arm and marches inside. He is met by the banners of blue and white ringing the walls, each bearing the crest of Keitel's empire, the Cabal Ascendancy. A pair of blue armoured phalanxes greet Saladin at the entrance with raised rifles, but the Iron Lord strides past without a glance. The phalanxes slowly lower their rifles and turn towards a heavily armoured Valus approaching from the other side of the hangar. You come alone, Valus O'Rourke bellows reaching up to wrench his helmet off. A pressurized hiss escapes as the environmental seal breaks. You are bold, Commander. Lord, Saladin corrects as he closes the distance between them. My title is Iron Lord. Valas Uruk comes to a stop, looking down at Saladin with narrowed eyes. Iron Lord Saladin. He tests the unfamiliar words with gnashing teeth. You are bold. I'm not here for flattery or your formal processions, Saladin rebukes, now within an arm's reach of the Valus. Saladin looks up at him, unafraid, undeterred. How do you want to do this? The Valus locks eyes with Saladin, then snorts loudly and rumbles with appreciative laughter. I have a war room, he says in a more conversational tone. No more boasts, no more chest beating. We are tracking the movements of Hive ships in the vicinity of the Mars Anomaly. There have been developments in the Dreaming City regarding Shivor Wrath you should be aware of, Saladin replies. Lead the way. This might have been the first time when Saladin and Uruk met each other, but it wouldn't be the last. Saladin continued in his duties as an envoy to the Cabal Ascendancy, and eventually, time would pass and the time of the Witch Queen would arrive. As the Vanguard and the Cabal Ascendancy began to work more closely together, Saladin would speak to Valas Uruk once again about the nature of the Valas' failure. The plot of Yurix to form a separative movement had been uncovered, and their actions in attempting to assassinate Commander Zavala were well known at this point. It seemed obvious that there was a traitor within the midst of the Ascendancy, and it had seemingly passed right under the Valas' nose. Saladin would confront the Valis as they both observed the newly re-emerged Mars, and it would be here that they would first begin to piece together the potential suspicions of who Eurix might serve, if they were in fact leading a separatist movement. Valis Uruk is a towering figure, looming large within his sparsely furnished ready room. The Cabal Admiral looks out over the gulf of space, flecked with the dusting of stars and the rust-coloured bead of Mars. Tell me again how I failed my duties, Valas Uruk says. He stares not at Mars, but into the glass, looking at his own muted reflection, and that of the small human at his back. 
Don't sulk, Saladin says, as he brandishes a data pad as though it were a knife. Valas O'Rourke glares at Saladin's visage. You insult me on my own ship, he growls. Saladin takes a few steps towards O'Rourke, jutting the data pad forward. You have no one to blame for these security holes but yourself, he asserts. This scion, Yurix, they were under your command. The assassin who tried to kill Zavala at the armistice signing was their direct subordinate. O'Rourke slowly turns, the rumbling rising in his chest. He looms over Saladin more than twice his height. Are you accusing me of something, Ambassador? The title is delivered like an epithet. Only of gross incompetence, Saladin retorts without moving an inch in the face of the Valis's posturing. If the Empress believed you were a traitor, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Saladin's eyes narrow. Laughter rises from Uruk followed by a dismissive wave of one huge hand. Go then, return to your vanguard and tell them of my folly. But know this, if what you have uncovered is true and Yerix serves a separatist movement within the Empire, the Valus snorts, then there is more at stake than you realize. Saladin's head tilts to the side as he reads Oroch's expression. In what way? There is only one person the Scions would swear to if not the Empress, Valis Rook explains. And if they are involved, it could drive her to recklessness. Name them, Saladin insists. Something to save your honor for this failure. Valis Rook turns to face the window again and the dark space. Who else could have such an impact on both the Empress and her empire? Rook's voice lowers to a whisper. Her father. Of course, it was later discovered that it was indeed Yerix who was leading the separatist movement on Mars and who was responsible for the psionic propaganda broadcasts that were allowing scions to find reason to defect from Keitel. It would also be revealed that it was indeed Callus who was working with Yerix in order to fund this operation. Later in the season of The Risen, there would also be the key moment of Saladin swearing fealty to the Cabal Empress in payment of Crow's life debt, and by extension, becoming Bracus Forge. This was a moment that, needless to say, saved the coalition between the Cabal Ascendancy and the Tower, but it was most definitely not a perfect solution to the problem that had arisen. There were those within the Ascendancy who would clearly have resented the appointment of a guardian to Keitel's War Council, and after the murder of a scion, no less. Keitel explains more about this in her communications to us, as she recalls how the Iron Lord was promoted from Bracchus to Valus. Greetings, Guardian. I come bearing enlightening news. Bracchus Forge has earned himself quite a reputation among the Cabal. Within his first three days aboard my ship, he was challenged to six rites of proving. He prevailed in them all. One of those challenges came from an officer on my war council. Bracchus Forge defeated him with a single thunderous blow. As is our custom, he was promoted to Valis for his courage. He has also started a version of the Iron Banner aboard my flagship at my request. There were many volunteers for his training. He calls his legionaries Iron War Beasts. We have much to learn from one another, and Valus Forge is an excellent ambassador. I dare say he even likes it here. And if a human can ascend to the rank of Valus in such a short time, imagine what the future holds. May we all live long enough to find out. Six rites of proving would mean that Saladin has taken out a sizable chunk of the Ascendancy's leadership, at least assuming that it was only powerful members of the Cabal hierarchy that challenged Bracchus Forge. Considering the nature of the Rite of Proving, it could be the case that simple legionaries were challenging Lord Saladin Forge, but ultimately I believe only those who were truly strong enough to consider themselves as possible victors over the Iron Lord would have challenged him. And if that's the case, then there may be a further reason for Lord Saladin to call himself Valus now, 
Whilst yes, he certainly earned the title through combat, if he has indeed killed six major officers within the Ascendancy, at this point, Keitel might have been running out of core officers at a certain level of her hierarchy. A rather amusing thought, if not a distressing one, considering the sudden attrition that's been caused by these, well, shall we say headstrong challenges? The greatest of the challenges that would face up against Saladin would, of course, be none other than Valas Gharn Ulruk, the same admiral that previously he had worked with, the same admiral from the lore tabs that we've just read. The great battle between them was recorded in the seasonal lore from the Quintessence lore book. This is what happened. Saladin hears Keitel's voice boom over the endless drone of the Imperial cruiser's engines. Grains of bloodied sand trickle from the ceiling of the cabal-sized elevator and fall against his helm as he rides up to the brightly lit arena floor. Gurn Uruk, Valus in the Empress's service. You challenge the Iron Lord, Saladin Forge, Bracus in the Empress's service. You outrank this man. Her words circle the spectator stands, sending a hush through the gathered crew. As it should be, Uruk, his challenger, stands not ten paces in front of him. Keitel presses. Why challenge him? Did this man slight you? Uruk turns to her, kicking up sand. He walks our halls, trains our soldiers, and shares our meals as if he is Cabal. That slights. He is not Cabal. I'm not the only one to say so. Saladin looks to Keitel. He'd attempted to stop this, tried to staunch unnecessary violence with reason, but tradition is not so easily denied. Earlier. This is ridiculous. Killing your officers only weakens us. Saladin stepped toward Keitel. Even seated in her chambers, her eyes were level with his. Funny how our perspectives have shifted since we first met, Keitel grunted. Why are you humoring this? Quieting rebellious words does not weaken us. It binds authority in blood. Keitel looked back to myriad datapads on her desk. If he submits, no one has to die. That seems likely, Saladin quipped sarcastically. Keitel stood. He wanted you stripped of your rank and made to clean war beast pens indefinitely. And that is worth his life? I know pride isn't a foreign concept to you, Lord. Keitel spat out his title and walked past him. Saladin sneered. The Empress turned to him as she opened her chamber doors, ushering him out. What if you lose? He huffed so hard he almost choked. Now. Keitel nods to Saladin, to a rook. They nod back. When the right of proving was conceived, it was to be a level field of battle. We honor that tradition here. Keitel slams a fist down for emphasis before pointing to the arena floor. Single combat by blades. One life, no light. Death or submission determines the victor. The crowd erupts in roars as the weapon rack rises from the floor. Uruk lifts a heavy cleaver from the rack. Saladin sees his own axe there. He glares at Keitel for taking it without permission and lifts the axe. With weapons drawn, the rite of proving begins. Uruk lunges and thrusts the cutting edge of his cleaver towards Saladin's ribs. Saladin sidesteps the massive cabal blade and bats it down with the haft of his axe. The two test each other's range and speed with a series of back-and-forth half-committed strikes, until Uruk gains favorable footing and bursts forwards to swing at Saladin's waist. Saladin narrowly tumbles over the cleaver. Sparks of contact spit from his leg guards. He lands on his knees and jabs the blunt head of the axe against Uruk's exposed throat. This is your chance to yield, Saladin says as the Valus sputters for air and stumbles backwards. Uruk's cough turns to laughter. He kicks up a cloud of sand and leaps with his cleaver brandished overhead. Saladin wipes granules from his visor and raises his axe to block Uruk's heavy swing. The Iron Lord absorbs the shock and controls Uruk's blade, sliding it down to catch on his axe head and pivoting the weapon's hefty pommel to butt Uruk hard in the face. 
O'Rourke staggers away and slashes wildly, splitting Saladin's visor and drawing blood. The Iron Lord throws his ruined helm to the ground and wipes blood. He advances, ducking under a deterring swing, parries a second chop away, and severs the Valus's hand. Yield! Saladin growls as blood pours onto the sand. O'Rourke looks to him, to the cleaver still clutched in his detached hand, and back to Saladin. Never to you! He dives for the cleaver. Saladin swings, catching O'Rourke's jaw, spewing blood. O'Rourke tenses for a moment, then falls limp. The Iron Lord sighs and wrenches his axe free, painted as a warrior in the eyes of the Cabal. Cheers erupt. Keitel's voice cuts through the frenzied crowd. Rise, Valus Forge. Valus Forge may have arisen as a champion according to the Cabal laws and ancient rites, but the rise of the Valus is unquestionably a massive blow to the Scions of the Ascendancy. They lost a voice in Keitel's inner circle, and the form of justice invoked by the Empress may well work for mainline Cabal species, but it does not work for the Scions necessarily. It may not be true justice in their eyes. One of their own was killed, and a Guardian now stands in his place. Later in the Psyops battlegrounds, we can see the massive effect that this has on the morale of the Scions within the Legion. It is not to be understated. Take a listen to this. Commander Zavala, I've just received a report regarding a missing cruiser from my fleet. A detachment of my forces has seen Lord Saladin's conscription as cause to defect. Defect? I thought you cleaned your house of disloyal operatives. Some require a more thorough shake to dislodge. I'm not 100% on this last detail, but there is a note in the Coalition shell about another warship which might potentially be the same one that was defecting from the Cabal Ascendancy and which was abandoned on the moon, and eventually the forces within supposedly were seen consorting with those who worked alongside Callus. An interesting moment for certain, and I think it's something that I only partly wonder about because there are two different terms being used. I believe the one used in the Ascendancy shell is something like frigate, and the word used in another entry, in other words the little bit of live gameplay at the end of the PSYOPs Battleground, is cruiser. I can't remember the exact order, but either way, it's two different words. Whether that matters or not maybe does make a distinction. Maybe it is the same ship, at which point Keitel has lost an entire vessel, but if it's not, she's lost multiple vessels to defectors. That's a huge blow, and all of it because of the appointment of Valus Forge. Whilst the Valus's rise is a great victory for the Coalition overall, the Scions will probably treat it with something close to disgust, and it's undoubtedly the biggest political win for Eurix and Callus to date. These moments and the actions that Crow undertook in the Sisorium were undoubtedly moments of poor decision making, and there will be consequences for those actions. Consequences that might already be playing out. The Iron Lord has faced six rites of proving so far, and yet they may not be the final challenges he or any of us face. Not thanks to the actions of Crow and to the rise of Valus Forge. But that's all from me for now, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and leave a like, and as per usual, know that you can leave your own thoughts down below in the comments section. If you want more Destiny content, hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. But as per usual, know that your viewership is quite enough for me. And in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Porodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.